Okay, there we are, Jim. Good to see you. Thanks for taking your time to come out with us this afternoon. Thanks, Joseph. Good to see you. Yeah, so for those that have tuned into the 30 previous episodes of this interview, which is live going out across Facebook and YouTube, the whole genesis came from the fact that when I was in the Army, I learned how to do what I did through asking platoon sergeants and first sergeants and all the lieutenants and the lieutenant mafia. And then when I got into business, I went around and asked every entrepreneur in the ecosystem in Austin at the University of Texas, how do you build a company? One beer at a time is kind of the, the cliche I put on that as far as how I built it. But now in the era of COVID, everybody is figuring this out on their own. So what I set out to do is to create a series of, of, first of all, conversations that were helping me. And then when I realized how smart these people were I was talking to, I went in search of a platform to be able to try to share it, all this information. So we're coming to you today on a platform that allows you, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, if you're seeing this video, to ask questions for the next 25 or so minutes. Uh, and Jim and I are going to talk to a whole number of things. But before I do... You know, Jim, obviously, we're always thinking about the sick and the caregivers that are there on the front lines. Secondly, we're thinking about those people that are just now losing their jobs, wondering how to pay rent and all their bills. And then thirdly, are all those small businesses and entrepreneurs and startups and the business community trying to hold it together. And for our viewers today, uh, there are a few people as qualified as Jim to talk about just all the different ways that traditionally money flowed and have him give his best opinions on how money is going to flow in the future. Uh, he's an expert at the University of Texas Macomb School of Business on everything from uh, access to capital, private equity. He served as an executive education and senior, senior distinct, distinguished senior lecturer. Uh, and really since 1980, you've been at this. So there's very little that you don't know about the past, Jim, but we're in uncharted territory. And when you look at Google, what everyone's wondering is, where's their relief money? Where's their stimulus money? And I was hoping you could spend a couple of minutes to break down for viewers the different kinds of money that are out there now. And then we're going to take the conversation in that direction, plus any questions that might come in from the audience. So thanks again for being here, Jim. And where do you want to start? First of all, how are you doing hunkered down? And then we'll get into the finance and money side of it. A little bit of cabin fever, but other than that, um, things are okay. We're conducting classes uh, online through Zoom and uh, kind of miss the face-to-face -face with the students and some of the guest speakers we have, but uh, it's working out. We'll get through the rest of the semester and hopefully things get better for us uh, by the time we start the fall. So, Well, we certainly hope so well. So on this notion of money, people keep hearing about stimulus package, the CARES Act, small business loans. I've got the IRS website here, the sba.gov website that we can kind of walk through people. But could you just give us a big overview of the different buckets of money? Because I think people are starting to confuse whether they're an individual or a business owner, what's out there and what might be available in form of relief. Sure. Well, we are in unprecedented uh, times. Uh, we have both fiscal and monetary policy trying to avert a uh, what is probably a recession, the question is how long, going into a depression. So um, on the monetary side, the Fed has injected a bunch of money into the economy and they've tried to stabilize the bond markets by buying up uh, mortgage-backed securities and other securities so that they can stabilize the financial markets and there's no panic, even though if you've been in the stock market, we've seen pretty extreme volatility over the last month. On the fiscal side, the, you know, with everybody being um, uh, at home and not working, you've lost a lot of that consumer spending. The U.S. economy, was, which was $20 trillion, basically um, is you know, 70% consumer spending. And with everybody staying at home, they're still ordering online and things, but with most people expect the contraction to be maybe somewhere between around 20 to 30%. So that could mean that maybe the GDP falls to 14, $15 million. And so in effect, the government said, well, all right, we'll replace that spending then with government spending, which is interesting because the government really doesn't have any money. They have our money. That's right. <laughs> but, our taxpayer dollars. Yes. But uh, but anyway, they, they've had several packages already. And the question is, is how you allocate all of that. So the 2.2 trillion CARES Act 
a portion of that's going to individuals. So, you know, we've all heard about the $1,200 per person if you make less than $75,000 and, uh, you know, if 150,000 if you're married and filed jointly. And then if you got kids under 17, another $600 for that. That those checks supposedly started going out, or at least the money started going out on Friday. They're not checks. If you filed your taxes in 18 and 19 and you did direct deposit, they've got your bank account information. So that money's coming directly from the treasurer from IRS. And they are going to send that money directly to your account. And those money supposedly started flowing on uh, Friday. If you didn't have get direct deposit and uh, they don't have your bank account information, then they're saying the checks in the mail is not going to be actually starting until probably the 1st of May. Wow. Those are for individual people. Now, they also allocated money for enhanced unemployment. So everybody's heard, if you've been watching the news, how hard it is to get through to the state unemployment. But there's the federal unemployment on top of that, but the states are administering that. So, you know, but just to put it in perspective, we've had 16 million people file unemployment in the last three weeks, uh, first time claims and things, which is about 20 times the volume that the and, state agencies And is it to say that that 20 times the normal volume exceeds the 20 times the capacity that we have to process those because we just sure. weren't designed for this sure. volume? Yeah, and I mean, they just can't handle the amount. First of all, their IT infrastructure, their uh, phone lines, the number of people, it just, you know, they just overwhelmed the system. And so they just can't process as many claims as are coming in, which is unfortunate because if you lost your job and you really need the money, luckily in the CARES Act, they also mandated that you can't foreclose on people if you can't pay your rent and the utility companies aren't going to turn your electric bills off. So there's right. some forgiveness going on. And of course that trickles on through. So if you don't pay your landlord, the landlord doesn't pay the rent to the, the mortgage to the bank. And the so bank on, has to and so agree, uh, Yeah. And so forth. So, uh, so there's been a little extra cushion there, but you know, for your basic needs of food and, and other things like that, if you're unemployed and the, uh, 40 or 50 percent of the U.S. population doesn't have more than maybe one paycheck in savings and things. So that runs out pretty quick. So right. that money's needed. And it's hard to me even get in to make your application, much less then go through the bureaucracy of getting the actual money paid to you. So that's that's a lot of what you said that you see on Google and things. People saying, where is that twelve hundred? Where is my six hundred dollars? Right. Uh, if you're unemployed, you know, the federal government is giving a thousand dollars a week on top of your normal, regular uh, unemployment thing. So some people that were in minimum wage jobs actually may be making as much, if not more than they were when they were working, if they can get. It. Yes. So then we turn to the other side of that. So three other things, the stimulus, the CARES Act at two point two trillion. Some was going to go to government and help them. Some was going to go to hospitals and and things like that to help the, the frontline people. But three hundred and fifty billion of it went into this uh, small business uh, TPP program, which was the payroll protection. So to stimulate to try and avoid having even more unemployment, the SBA uh was given $350 million basically to backstop banks by guaranteeing loans to small businesses to continue their payroll right. so that they wouldn't lay people off and therefore had the money to keep making payroll and wouldn't run the unemployment up even more than it is right now. That's right. Uh, so can uh, you speak to a second? So I pulled up this sba.gov site that's on there. Uh, can you speak to the fact that we keep hearing about people that fall inside of what they call the gig economy, those workers that are mostly W-9, you think of the delivery people and the drivers that are out there. How do they fall into all of this discussion? Very good. So on April 3rd, they opened it up to small businesses 
that had uh, employees and things, they started making applications. And I can tell you, you know, you read in the news, uh, Wells Fargo and Bank of America were getting 10,000 applications per hour. Yep. Because Wells Fargo was under some penalties for some of the things they did, they yeah, got we remember that. 10, they got capped at ten billion dollars, and they hit that the second day, and so they stopped taking applications. Now the government has since gone back and relaxed that where they're taking applications again. But just to give you an idea, the SBA generally only does thirty billion dollars a year in loan guarantees in normal times. And now they've been given 350 billion. So again, 12X what they're normally used to. So all of a sudden here come all these applications coming in and it just crashed their systems. It, I mean, it was difficult for lenders to get through. So a lot of people are complaining that I haven't heard anything and it's because, I mean, they still are running DOS, I think with, uh, you know, and, and some 8086 chips, uh, they just haven't upgraded their IT systems and things. So, so it's uh, the bottleneck is a lot of infrastructure, a lot of it just overwhelming volume. But, but the um, uh, so that that the April third was when the businesses started. The independent contractors or freelancers or gig economy, whatever you want to call it, they started actually on Friday the tenth. That was the first time they were eligible. Right. The file, which is interesting because they don't have a lot of them. There are 25 million businesses that don't have any employees. So this PPP was supposed to be the amount you could borrow based on 250 percent of your average monthly payroll that you had. Well, I don't have any employees. So there was some confusion at first of whether or not they were even eligible to file since they didn't have any employees. Well, the answer is yes, they are. If you are self-employed, you file a self-employment tax return and you take distributions instead of a check, instead of payroll that you're getting part of the income that you make from your business distributed to you, then uh, those people became eligible on Friday. Um, I can tell you that, um, there's a couple of things in here that aren't in the law. Number one, this money's getting used very quickly. That 350 million, I'll be surprised if it doesn't run out by the end of this week. Wow. Some of them are already saying that they want another 250 added to the program. That got blocked by the Democrats in the Senate. So that hadn't been approved yet because they're attaching other bills and riders and things, but, but they're already expecting this to be used pretty quickly. But I want everybody to think about, number one, some of the banks, even in the small businesses that started on the third, started making rules that I wouldn't do it unless you were already a existing customer with a business banking account. So if you were a new business and I hadn't done business with you, I'm not willing to submit that. So a couple of things started happening here. I started getting calls in Austin from some of the VCs. First of all, for yep. startups that are VC backed, under SBA rules, the because a big portion of your uh, ownership is with an institutional investor, in the past, the SBA requires anyone over 20% to give a personal guarantees and VCs wouldn't do that. So they've stayed away from the SBA loan programs historically. Well, this program, the PPP, has no personal guarantees and it's forgivable. So now the VCs are interested the problem is the SBA has a rule that they are affiliated and under that affiliation, they are ineligible. So all these small startups that are VC backed went to Silicon Valley Bank and people like that, Comerica's you know, technology group and things who aren't used to doing SBA and didn't even know, and they didn't know what the rule on affiliation was just to find out that they actually aren't eligible. So right. then the bank started saying uh, the banks that, said, no, I don't think we're going to do these or things. They started looking for new banks and all the then the banks started saying, well, we only want to deal with people that are existing customers. Now, there are some banks taking new customers and things, so you have to look and see. But that's one of the first questions everybody should ask is, are you accepting new customers if you're not going back to your regular bank? 
Yeah. So Jim, I have, something else I've been hearing in the news that I wanted to ask you about is it deals with fraud and groups that, especially when there's a lot of money out there, frauds and schemers tend to pop up. How do you guard yourself from an organization that pops up and says, hey, pay me $500 and I'll go out there and get all of your money. Uh, I'll get everything you're eligible for. How do you wade through that swamp, if you will? Yeah, actually, the SBA usually charges fees, and so does the bank to package SBA loans in this TPP program. They have waived all of that, so you can't charge that. Now, the SBA did allow for people to assist with packaging these things. There are pre-described um, uh, amounts that people can pay uh, for um, these uh, advisors and things. But that doesn't stop someone from going in and charging up front and seeing things like that. So first of all, I should never probably pay up front until they actually submit it and put it to the bank. You probably should pay at the back end. But I think these, um, yeah, for loans up to 350,000, they can't charge more than 1% for being an advisor. 0.5% from 350 to 2 million and 0.25 if it's over 2 million up to 10 million. So there's a fixed amount people can charge, number one. So see how much they're asking. And then the second is don't pay them up front. Yeah. Well, that is exactly the kind of advice I know a lot of people are looking for, or thinking about. So let's say you own a small business. You're not the, sing the, the senior distinguished lecturer at the Macomb School of Business, and you're trying to find all these answers. What are the best websites? What are the best resources? Where would you direct people to go if they see this video and want to know more, either from resources that you prefer or that you know that are out there? Well, well, first of all, let me just say that I'll give you another little hint here. So you say, what's in it for the banks? Because because they're lending their money. So yeah. a couple of things you need to know. First of all, does the bank have any money to lend? In other words, uh, if they've got a high loan to deposit already, if I'm already at 80% loans to the deposits I have, I don't have a lot of additional liquidity to make these lo additional loans. So banks that have low loan to deposit have lots of liquidity that want to do these loans are probably the best targets. Number two, the bank gets 100% guarantee. So that's one of the reasons they're interested. But Wait, the bank gets 100% guarantee if for yeah. some reason you default because you're that's not right. doing this? That's right. So, wow. so there's no risk to the bank of making this, but they do have, but they can't charge anything, but they the SBA does pay them a processing fee. They get 3%, and I mean, 5% on the first zero to 350,000. They get 3% from 350 to 2 million, and they get 1% from 2 million to 10 million. So the sweet spot is like 350 to a million, that 3%, because it's a smaller percent on a bigger dollar amount. Yeah. So if you're only asking for 10 or 20,000, you may get kind of put to the back of the line because 5% of $20,000. 20, is not very much money for them to go through all that processing. And then seven weeks from now, I have to turn around and make an application to the SBA for the forgiveness so they'll pay me my money back. Wow. So I bet that's not much money to cover all that work. So you may find that some of the banks, you know, are also leaning towards some of the bigger amounts. Now, have, you, have you seen more. anything to that in the news or anecdotally yet? Well, that's the interesting thing is I saw a chamber report that said there have been 250,000 businesses apply for this PPP for a total of $100 million. Well, if that's the case, that's an average of $4,000 per loan, which means your average payroll, if that's 250%, you had a really low. So I just don't think that number can be accurate. So I think the numbers are much bigger than that. And so I know my brother has got an architect firm. He got approved last year, last week, and he's supposed to be funded uh, today, I think. But he had 150 employees. Wow. So, um, so you're seeing that. So, you know, people that qualify, they, they can get pretty big. I mean, up to 500 employees and up to $10 million. 
that's a lot more dollars for the banks to do. So just be careful. At, the best thing they can do is go back and have a relationship with the banker they already know and have a relationship with and go back to them and say, where do I go? If you can't help me because you're overwhelmed, who would you recommend that I go talk to to help me package all the information? Because they work with individuals in the community that do this on a regular basis and get the referral from your banker. But if you don't have a banking relationship, that's a problem. Right. And you may find that's when the size matters, the type of bank matters. All of those issues start to come into play if you don't have a, 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 a contact at your uh, bank for your business. Right. So, you know, that was very helpful when you start talking about how people protect themselves from it. And you also address the gig economy or the contractors uh, or, or those freelancers. But for those businesses that I, I even heard of some that went and applied, found out like, you know, the Wells Fargo money uh, that was out within the, within the first two days, if they don't have a banker, they don't know someone, what are those favorite resources that you recommend that they start doing their homework on? Is it directly the SBA.gov website? Is it IRS.gov? Yeah. yeah, the SBA actually has a, uh, a link on there that says match, and they will match based on your location, uh, banks and uh, other resources that you can go to uh, to find help. Uh, the others is just network with other small business, but there are uh, there are community development companies, CDCs, that are SBA licensed to do 504 loans and things. They also package loans. So here in Austin, we have the Central Texas Community Development Corporation that's called Syntex CDC, uh, people like that. And all the women business councils uh, are licensed to do SBA loan packages the WBCs. And so both of those groups would be good to go to as well. And they all have uh, good connections with all the local banks. Right. Well, I'm a one person show here in this video production. You just rattled off about five, six great ideas. So afterwards, I'll follow up with you to hopefully get some of those links and those ideas put into the feed. I just dropped SBA.gov in there as well. So we're at the 22 minute mark and I usually try to wrap these up by 25 minutes. What, what question did I not ask you? What is something that you would think that individuals or small businesses need to know uh, going forward that we haven't talked about yet? Well, the problem is, is all these are short term fixes and we the uncertainty right now is we don't know when this is actually how long it's going to last and things will get back to quote normal. Uh, my guess is it'll be a rollout. Uh, it won't be open doors all at once. And so, you know, the question is, what happens if you run through? So they've given you two and a half months of payroll, basically. If this thing gets into June, July, now what? So yep. for, for the restaurants, for the hotel industry, uh, for the gig economy, uh, if you drive for Uber and things, that could be a while before that comes back to any kind of volumes that we're used to seeing. And then on top of that, you throw in in Texas, the oil industry and what's happening there um, down in Houston and things and the ripple effect from that of houses not closing and you start getting into now self-employed people like appraisers and inspectors and things like that if houses aren't closing. So it could get, uh, if it doesn't open up soon, the damage to the economy and that you're already starting to hear people say, we don't want the cure to be worse than the disease. Right. And while we don't like the loss of life and everything, you could do so much damage to the economy that we end up with 25, 30% unemployment. And some of these businesses, I mean, I've dealt with small businesses a long time. There, there's you know, almost 30 million small businesses in the U S and most of them don't have big cash reserves to get them through a long period of downtime. Most don't carry business interruption insurance. And even if they did, I'm not sure this qualifies as not being an act of God. And so, um, uh, all of those things, they just don't have. So to see how many, even if we open back up, will be able to actually regain the momentum they had. Right. I mean, if you're a restaurant and people, while you had some drive through and takeout, 
maybe, but when it opens back up, to think that you're going to have a full restaurant, are people suddenly going to be comfortable going out and sitting in a closed in space next to someone? I just don't know how long that confidence in the consumer takes to come back. So it's a new normal going forward, no doubt. I mean, and there are parts of the economy that have benefited from this. Uh, people that make, you know, protective uh, clothing and people uh, that uh, can work from home that can still do things that are necessary, such as some of the software things. Uh, companies are still worried about, you know, cybersecurity, things like that. And of course, all the people that are, I mean, we can't forget about our, you know, supply chain and food and all the drivers and people like that that are still having to work That's and right. put in overtime and everything else in order for us to still be able to get the things that we need. So yes. hopefully these programs help those kinds of people. That's who need the help right now. Well, absolutely. And that's actually a perfect note to end on as we began the conversation, which is remembering those people that are sick, that are at the front lines, the healthcare workers. And then you so eloquently address those people that now find themselves out of work. And that third group, those businesses that you've been working with for years uh, that are now finding themselves in tough times, hard making payroll. Uh, Jim, this has been chock full of resources. And like I say, I'm going to link to a lot of this when we move it over onto LinkedIn as well. And hopefully if Hopefully this doesn't go longer, but if this continues into the summer, I'll try to have you back to answer more questions. How's that sound? Sounds great. All right. Thanks a lot, Jim. Take care. Yeah. See ya. You too. So I hope you enjoyed this latest live interview. Uh, Jim Nolan, you can see his biography in the comment sections below. He has been there, done that in terms of figuring out how to solve many of these problems. If there are other topics, if there are other people that you want to hear from or have answers about, please uh, contact me on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter. Get in touch with me through the same links that you see here. Leave comments. The whole point of doing this is to make sure that as we try to approach all three of those tiers, of the caregivers, those that are recently out of work, and those that are trying to hold their businesses together, which pretty much wraps up everyone, uh, that we want to provide the best information as fast as we can. Because as stated by Catalyst, the book that we wrote a couple of years back here at Gray Line, it's all about leadership and strategy in a changing world. And there's no better example in a changing world than the COVID world we live in. Stay safe, stay at home, wash your hands, keep the social distance from others. And if you are working, stay safe and thank you for what you do. Take care. Have a great afternoon.